from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow said, music is the universal language of mankind. No one understands that more deeply than the Librarian of Congress. For more than 25 years, Dr. James Billington, the Librarian of Congress, has embodied the belief that it is our sacred duty to do our best to collect, secure, and make accessible the treasures and collections of the Library of Congress. He also believes in the power of music and its ability to connect each of us to the other, regardless of border or spoken language. He's deeply committed to studying our history, but he goes beyond the, the traditional tools used for this purpose to encourage studying history through the songs that we sing. He has a partner in this belief, Thomas Hampson, Hamson's association with Dr. Billington and the Library of Congress is long-standing and born of his passion for history and storytelling, along with his incredible talent, his voice. The former, the passion for storytelling and history, he shares with Dr. Billington. The latter, if you've ever heard Dr. Billington sing, There Stands the Glass, you will understand why he leaves the singing to Tom. <laughs> Your voice is charming, Dr. Billington, but don't give up your day job. <laughs> Both men have championed websites that reinforce the connection between songs and history, Songs of America, which I recommend to you. Tom is one of the library's living legends, and he holds the title of Special Advisor for the Study and Performance of Music in America, and we think of him primarily as a friend. Eight years ago, Dr. Billington and Thomas Hampson joined forces to produce the highly successful national concert tour, the 2006-2008 Song of American Tour, featuring Thomas Hampson performing historically significant songs that poignantly tell the stories of our nation and its people. This tour covered more than 18 cities throughout the North, South, East, and West, playing to suburban, rural, and university audiences. And thus we come to today's presentation, celebrating the history of our nation through the Star Spangled Banner and other patriotic songs. It was a natural fit for this program to be held here at the Library of Congress because we are the preeminent repository of Star Spangled Banner manuscripts and history. As you can see, in the things that we have on display in our exhibit cases in the foyer, I hope you noticed when you came in that the first broadside, there are only maybe 10 of them in existence, um, is on display there, and also the first printed edition. They're absolutely stellar artifacts. Um, and then we have more in the Great Hall upstairs. So the music division has rich holdings documenting the birth and history of our national anthem. We invite you to spend some time, if you haven't already, visiting these displays. I will leave to this afternoon's participants um, to enlighten us further about the history of the Star Spangled Banner, but before we keep begin, I'd like to acknowledge and thank some of those who made this concert possible. We've been delighted to have the pleasure of collaborating with Susan Key, the executive director of the Star Spangled Music Foundation. I'm not sure, Susan, you? Okay, okay. Um, the Star Spangled Music Foundation and the Library of Congress are the primary sponsors of this thing. Um, Mark Clegg is really the the glue, the passion, the brains behind what we have put together here. He's Associate Professor of Music, American Culture, and African American Studies at the University of Michigan. 
So we need to thank the University of Michigan for enabling him to come here and also I should mention that our pianist, Matthew Thompson, and the excellent chorus today are faculty or alumni of, from the University of Michigan. You'll be able to see them in a minute. That's okay. um, and then finally, I wanted to recognize, I understand he's here, I hope he is, John Gray, director of the Smithsonian's American History Museum, which is the now permanent home of the Star Spangled Banner that flew over Fort McHenry. Uh, John, are you here? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so um, you've already kind of uh, trumped my next phrase, which is a sentence, but there will be, there's going to be a significant amount of audience participation required of you today. So let's see if you're ready by joining me for a very warm thank you to all those partners who have helped create the magic of this very special educational celebration for us today. Enjoy the show. Well, I don't have to say it's a thrill to be here with you today. Um, today's recital celebrates a song, or maybe more broadly, American song itself. The Star Spangled Banner marks its 200th birthday this very year. It was at dawn on September 14th, 1814, in the aftermath of the Battle of Baltimore that Francis Scott Key glimpsed the United States flag, defiant and waving over Fort McHenry. Key, who had witnessed the burning of Washington firsthand less than a month before, was inspired by the heroism of Baltimore's defenders and wrote the song we know today as our nation's anthem. Yet in truth, Key's anthem is so much a comfortable part of our lives in America today that we know surprisingly little about its history and what we think we know is often distorted by legend. For the American citizens here today, we hope that you'll learn a few new things about your song. For those who are not Americans, or not yet Americans, you may just understand a bit better how the surprisingly complex story of Francis Scott Key's song has a lot to say about America's trial and error experiment with democracy. The eyes of poets and the ears of composers are the diary of our nation. We tell the story to one another, to our children, to our future children, our grandchildren, through our arts and humanities, through our songs. Our songs are the diary of who we are as Americans from various races, races and various cultures that built this incredible country under the motto, e pluribus unum. The emphasis being pluribus. And there's no greater story, and I must admit to you, I didn't know it until I met this man. <laughs> no greater story of this country becoming this country and wrangling and wrestling with one another about what we determine is collectively important than the history of all of the words that have gone to one single tune called the Star Spangled Banner. So there are actually four anniversaries we're celebrating today. The 200th anniversary of the Star Spangled Banner, uh, the 150th anniversary of the Civil War, and this will come up in the program and the pieces we've chosen will set on the Civil War, um, almost the 100th anniversary of World War I, and the then beginning. of course, the beginning of World War I, yes, and then of course the 4th of July, the 238th birthday of our country. I also want to say one thing about the program. You're going to be hearing a certain melody pretty frequently, and um, you might be compelled to stand up suddenly and put your hand over your heart. If you do that throughout the program, you might get a little dizzy. It, it, it would, you could be a, get a nice aerobic workout, but just be careful. So we invite you to stay seated, actually, for the early parodies and for even the, the Star Spangled Banner in its original version, which we'll present. But we do ask you to participate. Tom will be your director. Watch him. And then also, there are two songs. So you'll be asked to end the program, we'll sing the sort of service version, the current traditional version of the Star Spangled Banner. We ask you to stand and join us in that, hand over heart. And the flag, if you're looking for it, is right there. And also, the song right before that, Lift Every Voice and Sing, within the African American community, it's traditional to stand for that. So I was thinking we would honor that tradition here One. today as well. So 
We're going to start today with a composer right. who was pretty desperate to be the first American composer, so desperate, in fact, that he signed the Declaration of Independence himself. <laughs> That's a new take on it. I've never heard it put quite that way. <laughs> well, I always thought, you know, was he the first composer, was he not? Well, he signed the document. He's pretty well, much there I on the ground floor. In, 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 in 1759, Francis Hopkinson wrote a song called My Days Have Been So Wondrous Free. And it was published quite a bit later in the collective of songs and, and violin pieces. And he sent them to George Washington, his very good friend. And he said, I think that one can afford me the title as the first American that has actually set music in an American way or with an American sentiment on our soil. Uh, George wrote back and said, Francis, I'm a little busy up here on the Potomac. I appreciate all that. Um, much less, I also have a tin ear, and I wouldn't know the difference between a tune or a I won't say what the word he said. <laughs> but I'm very happy for you, and I, I certainly agree with you, and you know, onward and forward. So what I thought I'd do is sing two or three of Francis Hopkins' songs, the My Days Have Been So Wondrous Free, or The Hills, and uh, Disdain My Bleeding Heart, or I'll look at the title later. As well, I thought what might be kind of fun, since the anachronic ode comes from England, and we know quite definitely that there was a performance in 1790, 1791 in this club, not pub. It is not a drinking song. <laughs> that there were libations in a social club whose evening started with the two hours of symphony and went on to discourse and exploration of new music. And there were libations, yes there were, but this was not a song to drink to. It was a celebratory song praising a poet, Anacreon, who was their emblematic figure. And at this 1791 session, in fact, Joseph Haydn played a symphony for them coming from Vienna. And he loved the group and he loved England very much. And he also set some songs to English texts. And I thought we'd just close out the first group with one of his most famous and popular songs, the Sailor's Song, which of course gives us the sentiment of what the British thought of the world at that time through the eyes and ears of Mr. Haydn. So that's our first group of four songs, and I'll, I'll let you, you later. know. Thank you. 
I've ever heard these songs before. I'm a little surprised because the <laughs> one after the other is quite as charming as the other one. It's quite fun. And Francis Hopkinson, I mean, imagine, the signer of the Declaration of Independence, actually was a judge on the Admiralty Court, which was the forefather to our Supreme Court. Very important man in our history. And his son was also very important, but we'll talk about him a little bit later. Marvelous songs. Yet, Joseph Haydn. chorus will now join us, I think. <laughs> Gentlemen, it's time. <laughs> I've warmed them up. The story begins in London, England, as Tom said, in a gentleman's music club, not a pub, around the time of our own revolution. The club is known as the Anacreontic Society. Don't say that too fast, you might hurt yourself. And the constitutional song that they sing at every single meeting is called the Anacreontic Song. So we already know that we sing the song, that we have a two-hour symphony concert. What you're going to do next is go out for dinner. We'll have a pretty much a cold dinner of sandwiches because this concert could run over, so we don't want to have the hot food get cold, so we'll have sandwiches. We'll come back, and then we're going to have an evening of singing songs. And this is really what this song is about that we're about to perform, and, and really the tradition that gets carried all the way through Francis Scott Key to our own day is the way in which this song forms a community, that it brings people together. In its original sense, 
the members of the club. So let me introduce to you <coughs> the members of the University of Michigan's Men's Alumni Chorus playing the role of the members of the Anacreontic Society. And I'd like you to meet our president, <laughs> Mr. Rafe Tomlinson. <laughs> what? <laughs> president of the Anacreontic Society seeing the words he wrote just a few years ago. To Anacreon in heaven I sat in full glee A few sons of harmony sent a petition That he their inspirer and patron would be When this answer arrived from the jolly old Grecian Voice, fiddle, and flute, no longer be mute. I lend you my name and inspire you to boot. And besides, I'll instruct you like me to entwine. The myrtle of Venus with Marcus is mine. And besides, I'll instruct you like me to entwine. So happily planned, you're the sanction of gods and the fiat of Jove. While the sea and we are toasted in peace, may our club flourish happy, united and free. And long may the sons of Anacreon entwine the myrtle of Venus with Bacchus is mine. So I think you can understand it's a, it's a party song. It's a song of celebration. It's a song of coming together and doing what we love to do, which is to make music. You probably recognized one thing, a certain melody. You may recognize that throughout the course of the afternoon. You might have been surprised by a couple things. First of all, the existence of these guys, right, that we have a chorus, right? Also, the tempo is much faster, again, because it's a, a song of celebration. When we get to Francis Scott Key, he had a good reason to celebrate as well, which would be a great reason to choose this tune. So the chorus, I think, is important because, again, they, they echo what our president says, and we do whatever our president says. <laughs> but what's happened here is an, an English tune has come to the new world. And of course, we're culturally British for the most part. This is not a particularly unusual thing, right? To write a song of fellowship for our friends, to, to have music come over here. In fact, it's happened before. A song once British, then American. A song called Yankee Doodle. This is a group participation song. <laughs> you got the melody. I'm going to sing the words you never learned. And then it's going to be Yankee Doodle, keep it up. Yankee Doodle, dandy. Mind the music and the step. With the girls be handy. I'm going to point, and you're going to sing. <laughs> and when I don't point, you're not going to sing. <laughs>
was Captain Washington upon a slapping sky. I'm giving orders to his men, I guess it was a million. Some had ribbons red as blood all bound around their needles. Yankee Doodle, keep it up, Yankee Doodle, Yankee. Find the music and the step and with the girls be handy. The troopers too would gallop up and fire right in our faces. It scared me almost half to death to see them run their races. Yankee Doodle, keep it up, Yankee Doodle. I'm thinking we may have some good prospective members. I think. Yeah, but the initiation good. fee is huge. <laughs> it's true. We're a high class establishment, as I'm sure you can tell. So this British tune becomes part of American popular culture. And it joins a repository, a resource of tunes used for what's known today as the broadside ballad tradition. So poets, lyricists would take the news of the day, take the ideas of the day, take the momentous occasions of the day, and write new lyrics to share not just the news, we could get the news from the newspaper, but to share what it felt like to be present at momentous events. The tune Anacreon in Heaven was one of these tunes that everyone would have known. And by far the most popular tune, far outstripping Francis Scott Key's Star Spangled Banner, at least in the early part of the century, was a song called Adams and Liberty, written in support of our second president, John Adams. So it's often said today that Francis Scott Key wrote a poem that was set by someone else to music, that the person who put the text and the tune together was not Francis Scott Key. There are two great reasons, other than the fact that it's right, to conclude that Key wrote not a poem but a song. He wrote a lyric from the very outset imagining these words to match the tune which we've all come to know so well and which Francis Scott Key, I can prove, actually knew himself. So the first reason we know that he wrote an anacreontic lyric rather than just a lyric that was randomly placed for this tune is its unusual poetic form. So all of the anacreontic lyrics we've done so far have eight line stanzas. The normal is four line stanzas. And each one of them has an extra rhyme. So not only does the last word rhyme, but in the fifth line, there's an extra rhyme in the middle. So there's eight lines and nine rhymes. You can check me. There you've got the text there. I have proof. <laughs> right? So I, professors make things up sometimes. But in this case, you can learn for yourself and check. Okay? So you do not randomly, accidentally write an eight-line poem with nine rhymes, especially in exactly the right place. The other reason we know for a fact that Francis Scott Key knew this melody is because he had used it before for a song that he wrote in 1805, his first patriotic song titled, When the Warrior Returns. 
in honor of Stephen Decatur Jr., our first naval hero from the Battle of the Barbary Pirates. When the warrior returns from the battle afar to the home and the country he nobly defended, all warmly the welcome to gladden his ear, and loud be the joy that his perils are ended. In the full tide of song, let his fame roll along to the feast flowing aboard, let us gratefully throng, where mixed with the olive. Shall wave and form a bright wreath for the brows of the brave. Where fish with the army, the bow shall wave and form a bright wreath for the brows of the brave. Columbians, a band of your brothers, behold, who claim the reward of your heart's warm emotion when your cause, when your honor. Just blood worth the fall in vain from the desert, in vain rage the ocean to a far distant shore, to the battle's wild roar. They rushed your fair fame and your rights to secure. Then, mixed with the olive, the laurel shall weave and form a bright wreath for the brows of the brave. Then, mixed So we've made it. We're at the Star Spangled Banner. We're aboard Key's American truce ship, detained during the Battle of Baltimore for two days. He witnesses history being made and does what poets do when they have strong emotions and a lot of time on their hands. He writes, but in this case, you're an expert, not a poem, but a song. Let's do it again. Not a poem, but a song. Very good. This is a smart group. <laughs> and he writes, in fact, an upbeat victory song, using the same tempo and the same affect that he had just used nine years earlier for a song called When the Warrior Returns, right? So here we present the original, first published version of Key's song as it might have been heard in Key's own time. <laughs> So proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose bright stripes and bright stars through the perilous night, for the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof to the night that our flag was still there. For sailors that star spangled. So vauntingly 
Sorry, that's not our anthem. <laughs> but it could be in some places. That was wonderful. You that's just better get a very you better, you better get a very good pianist. Let's introduce Matthew Thompson, who's my colleague at the University of Michigan. Really happy to have him here today. I'm sorry. <laughs> That little piano coda that he does, people love that. It, that. That little thing gets repeated in basically every single printing of the Star Spangled Banner up past the Civil War. So that, that's, that was one of the great hits of the 19th century, that little thing. <laughs> so today, the Star Spangled Banner is a sacred hymn to our nation. In the 19th century, it's a song of celebration, certainly a very popular song, but it's another broadside ballad. It's something that can be itself transformed, parodied, and made different, I guess. <laughs> um, but as the patriotic fervor that's in reaction to the War of 1812 grows, and this melody becomes ever more American, starting with things like Adams and Liberty, working through a bunch of Fourth of July celebration texts, um, things like the Star Spangled Banner, other poets, including those who were social activists, transform this tune into a song of protest. And we'd like to share two of those with you. And this, I think for me, is the most fascinating part of this history is that this song really shapes who we are as Americans. And it was used as a kind of sounding board, as a kind of place where one would argue about the future and the meaning of what it means to be American. So as this song equals America and Americans, who gets to sing it? Who does that define? And these issues of race and class and ethnicity and gender were constantly, unfortunately, expanding this notion of what it means to be human and to be equal. And this song was used as a place where that argument took place. So one of the issues in America was the issue of alcohol, the issue of temperance, right? And if this were a drinking song, do you think they would choose it as a song to argue for not drinking? I don't think so. Um, so this is a text that I really love. Um, oh, who has not seen? Could you read oh, a little bit? Oh, who has not seen? I, we thought it would be interesting, instead of just keep repeating and singing the same tune, I'll read 
a couple of the verses quickly or regular rhythm and you get the tune in your head probably never out again but never mind <laughs> yeah, I certainly won't uh, but it is a remarkable thing you really should visit the various websites and of course start with the great with the great uh, Library of Congress website which has all of these texts and all of this stuff I mean quite frankly if we didn't have this miraculous and unique institution in the world how would we be able to document even our own warts for the rest of the world it's a very important project. <laughs> On tour, I said, this is not a government institution. It's the largest shoebox ever created <laughs> for all the stuff that's yours. Oh, who has not seen by the dawn's early light some poor bloated drunkard to his home weekly reeling? With blear eyes and red nose, most revolting to sight, yet still in his breast, not a throb of shame feeling. And the plight he was in, steeped in filth to his chin, gave proof through the night in the gutter he'd been. <laughs> While the, the pitiable wretch would stagger along, to the shame of his friends mid the jeers of the throng. To his home when he came, half frantic with ire, that his poor wife had dared while he reveled to sleep. Though wretched and faint neath misery's ire, she had striven, all in vain, her sad vigils to keep. And tears gushing chased down her woe-begone face in the furrows which sorrow and suffering trace to see her loved Lord like a wild demon rave, to the vilest of sins, a beast and a slave. But thanks to that band who so faithfully swore that the havoc of rum and the bottle's confusion, our home and our country should ravage no more. If aught might overcome the foul curse and pollution, they're striving to save the victim and slave from the horrors of guilt and the drunkard's dark grave. And the temperance banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the Drink up. <laughs> well, one of the great diarists of our country, certainly, was Stephen Foster. Stephen Foster's dream in his life was to do what Thomas More had done for the Irish melodies and documenting the favors of Irish life and Anglo-Saxon life, if you will. He wanted to do that for America. And he took snapshots of all sorts of lives through his very short and actually tragic life. And of course, he was also caught up in the fervor, not only of temperance, but of the guilt of lapse. And he wrote this rather remarkable song called, Comrades, Fill No Glass For Me. Fame. 
The next song and its verses are without question some of the most disturbing verses I've ever read. I mean that quite seriously, and you'll see why. That these words in this magnificent, ornate arrangement of a tune that was even in its time known as the Star Spangled Banner could be rendered accessible to certainly not only the victims that this text implies, but to the sensibilities of everyone's pride as an American, is an astounding document of the middle 19th century. Oh, say do you hear at the dawn's early light the shrieks of those bondmen whose blood is now streaming from the merciless laugh while our banner in sight, with its stars mocking freedom, is fitfully gleaming. Do you see the backs bare? Do you mark every score of the whip of the driver trace channels of gore? And say, doth our star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. On the shore dimly seen through the mists of the deep where Africa's race in false safety reposes, what is that which the breeze or the towering steep as it heedlessly sweeps, half conceals, half discloses? Tis a slave ship that's seen by the morning's first beam, and its tarnished reflection pollutes now the stream. Tis our star-spangled banner, oh, when shall it wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave?
I didn't live then, because I certainly would have died at Harper's Ferry. Another song of Stephen Foster capturing very much the times that are extremely difficult to explain, very complex 1840s and 50s, enormous immigration, political appeals, the far right extremely accept, ex uh, excited about the immigration of Catholics and Germans. Uh, polluting our society, the far left fighting amongst themselves about who can get jobs under what circumstances <laughs> amongst those that are Americans and those that became Americans. Not much has changed. <laughs> Dickens wrote a rather incredible novel called Hard Times, and that went like a wildfire across Western civilization, quite frankly. And out of that came Stephen Foster's song, Hard Times, which is singularly the most rearranged song in American history by other genres and other people since it became publicly known. We all know the song. If you feel compelled to hum along, don't resist. Hum with us. Gentlemen. <laughs> Falls in life's pleasures and count its many tears while we all sub sorrow with the poor. There's a song that will linger forever in our ears. Oh, hard times come again no more. Tis the song, the song.
Before we get tempted to pick up the temperance side of things again, <laughs> Stephen Foster, the cries of Stephen Foster as a baby, the first day of his life, drowned out whatever message that might have been that John Adams and Thomas Jefferson had just died on the 4th of July, 1826, the day that Stephen Foster was born. He led a very tragic and very short life. He was briefly happy, intermittently, but didn't know it. <laughs> and he got involved in the fervor, of course, out of Pittsburgh for the northern side of the Civil War. And he wrote a couple of very rousing Civil War rally songs, as it were. And one of them, slightly humorous and very vernacular of the day, was called, That's What's the Matter. Sad for birth to rough for rhymes, the songs of peace have lost their chimes. And that's what's the matter. The men we held as brothers true have turned into a rebel crew, so now we have to put them through. And that's what's the matter. That's what's the matter. The rebels have to scatter. We'll make them flee by land and sea. And that's what's the matter. Democrats would take their side, then they would let the Union slide. And that's what's the matter. But when the war had once begun, all party feeling soon was gone. We joined as brothers, everyone. And that's what's the matter. That's what's the matter. The rebels have to scatter. We'll make them flee by land and sea. And that's what's the matter. So help to Captain Erickson, I cannot tell what he has done. I never stopped when once begun. And that's what's the matter. That's what's the matter. The rebels have to scatter. We'll make them flee by land and sea. And that's what's the matter. We've heard of General Beauregard and thought he'd fight us long and hard. He has played out his last card, and that's what's the matter. So what's the use to fret and count? We soon will hear that people shout, Secession Dodge is all played out, and that's what's the matter. That's what's the matter. The rebels have to scatter. We'll make them flee by land and sea. which is not my lot in life. <laughs> and we're going to keep on going. We don't have so many more things. But we thought it might be interesting for the feeling of the times, uh, this 1814, 1864, 1914, 19, whatever it is, <laughs> and Lincoln, the Civil War and all that. Talk about diaries. Walt Whitman, of course, one of the greatest diarists, if you will, chroniclers of our times, wrote a remarkable poem 
as an evidence of something, I don't know if he saw it or whether he imagined it, based on Sherman's march to the sea, which is far too complicated for me even to start. But there was a time at the beginning of the march when the African Americans actually thought Sherman was there to save them. And he had hundreds of thousands marching with him. And Whitman has created this rather remarkable poem of some slug soldier feeling quite oppressed by his leader, Sherman, Dotty Sherman to be exact, marching him down to something he has no idea why he's going there. And as he's marching by, he sees this remarkable vision of a creature he's never seen before in his life, a rather noble black woman, certainly just arrived from Africa in full regalia, full beauty, full nobility, if you will, in front of a hovel. And he's marching along, and as he looks at her, she salutes the procession. And out of this comes this remarkable poem called Ethiopia Saluting the Colors. And to bring the entire story even more into split-second focus in our society, Henry T. Burleigh, the absolute grandfather and dean of all African-American classical composers in this country, mostly famous for his beautiful arrangements of his own Negro spirituals, himself a grandson of a non-liberated slave, and Dvorak's closest musical confidant at the turn of the century, set this poem to music. You will hear tunes that you recognize probably mostly as Mary Had a Little Lamb, but in fact, it's the old marching tune, Marching to Georgia. Oh, 
Yes, you can teach American history, civics classes, social studies, through song. And you can choose a number of helpers. The granddaddy of them all, of course, is here, Songs of America. If you want to look at poetry even closer, Song of America. And both those sites will give you a myriad of other sites about our songs in this country. In 2009, we celebrated the 200th anniversary of the birth of Abraham Lincoln. There were not as many celebrations as I thought there would be, but quite proudly, my hometown, Spokane, Washington, commissioned its orchestra to have a piece written for me for the orchestra. And they chose one of the preeminent composers of our time, Michael Doherty. He only happens to be quite by accident also from University of Michigan. <laughs> Through this whole project, I've realized I've got some sort of tattoo back here, lost property of the University of Michigan. <laughs> and he wrote this marvelous cycle, and we talked long about what texts and so forth, and we decided Lincoln was the center point. We decided, let's only use Lincoln's word. And the last thing I said to him was, well, whatever you do, Michael, have a great time. Just don't set the Gettysburg Address. So the last song in this 35-minute cycle is the Gettysburg Address, <laughs> and it's quite wonderful. But in the middle of this wonderful cycle, the third song, is a remarkable evidence of something that happened, truly happened, although its historical context is more myriad and more con convoluted than I'm going to get into today. But it's called the famous letter to Mrs. Bixby, which Abraham Lincoln certainly signed, whether he dictated it or whether it was given to him, signed his sentiment. He was, however, deeply upset by the idea that a woman had lost five sons in battle. And it was, in fact, this letter was also part of the evidence uh, offered much, much later as the country was trying to determine what would be fair to families or not fair to families in the time of war. And this was a letter that was brought as evidence of how a family should not have to endure by misfate the loss of more of its sons. Uh, Michael has given us a rather remarkable setting here, and this is Lincoln's own words to Mrs. Bixby.
So you may have noticed these snazzy buttons that Tom and I have, and I want to tell you how you can get your own button. But this is uh, a talk about Star Spangled Music Day, which is a project of the Star Spangled Music Foundation. And what we really want is for K-12 educators and students all around the country to talk about the history of the Star Spangled Banner, to stamp out some of these myths, and to celebrate the song this fall, just before the anthem's anniversary. So the date of inspiration, the actual birth date is a Sunday, September 14th, 2014, and so we're suggesting that that Friday before the 12th, that everybody celebrate the song. If you go to www.starspanglemusic.org or the Hanson Foundation or other places, we'll make sure you have information on some ideas you could use to celebrate it, but also you can get all the scores that we use today are freely available on that website. So if some of which you can find on the Library of Congress website in the very original forms, but we have brand new modern performance editions they're easy to read, that you can hopefully keep track of all those words, which is an incredible feat that this man has done. So please, just I want to just thank Tom for really embracing this project and, and just really partnering with me.
so one of the things he insisted we do is to really share another part of the anthem story and the way it represents America and just who gets to be American. So it turns out that despite some of the political kerfuffles we have these days, that the notion of translating the anthem into other language was actually quite common and typical in the 19th century. In fact, the first version that I know that was translated is one we'll perform in a few minutes in German, yeah. which was probably part of a union effort to record, recruit the former Hessian troops that had been brought over for the British to the Union side. So we wanted to make friends and we put it in their language. Um, there's also a version in Spanish from World War I. There have been official versions from, sanctioned by the government, or at least distributed by the government, to try to make friends with people, believe it or not, by translating our anthem into other languages. What a good idea. Huh. But also immigrant communities, especially churches, Norwegian, Czech, Native American communities, and Cherokee and Navajo have taken this anthem and made it their own and really brought that to the fore. And that's, that's really the magic, I think, of this song, is that it allows us to express our own citizenship, to put our own heart, devotion, and commitment to our country in these performances. And we should make that as broadly accessible as we can. I think some musicologists sitting in here between the age of 20 and 21 <laughs> should take these editions and take little bits like this last tag, bum ba da dim bum ba da dim bum ba da where that keeps showing up. You heard it in the abolition song, and now you heard it in this German song, probably not a long time away from one another, but still significantly. Could have been the same arrangement. Where did that come up from? Where did this idea of, of the different forms of this melody and its harmony, and truly counterpoint played a much stronger point in, in this last arrangement by probably the German arranger. Anyway, I challenge you to write us a paper. We don't like to know. <laughs> now, I personally find the Spanish accent in the English language enormously attractive. And I'm hoping desperately that the American accent in what I'm about to sing Actually, I fear it's going to be more Italian than, <laughs> than American. But in all respect and love and kindness, and I had been told that there was a Spanish-speaking member of our chorus, but alas, he didn't show up, or <laughs> they lied to me. It's been a while since I've sung a thing in Spanish, so if you are Spanish-speaking, cut me some slack. <laughs> Adios, Dios mío, mal, 
I called Placido, but he didn't answer. <laughs> it's gorgeous. I tell you, it's remarkable that you can imagine looking at all these. And of course, when Mark and I first got together, he brought me a, a, a binder of, it must have been 60 different versions of this. And I said, <laughs> you can't be serious. <laughs> and we started writing. But what is remarkable, and I'm sure you've also caught it, is that the tune stays the same, but the alliteration of the language and the expression has to change to sort of fit it, and everybody just left the tune where it was, where you get these little funny accents once in a while. It's quite a challenge. You should try it sometime. <laughs> it sounds like, and I love the fact, I think, I think it was Mark who coined the phrase, that because everybody's complained that our national anthem is so damn difficult to sing. They're right. <laughs> but somebody came up with the phrase, I'm quite sure it was Mark, that it is an athletic melody. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. That's a, precisely what it is. It's very athletic. Gentlemen. Huh? Oh my goodness, I forgot a song. All right. We're now in 1914, a little bit into 1917, and there is a wonderful American, another great chronicler of America, Charles Ives. And he's not happy about World War I. And he gave voice not just to the kinds of rousing sentiments when we agree that we must be aggressive, but more the thoughtfulness of ascertaining what the consequence could be. And, and this song in Flanders Fields is all about the responsibility of those great and brave people who died that we may celebrate our culture. Flanders Fields.
It's now sing-along. In your program, you have the words to America the Beautiful, lift every voice and sing, and yes, the Star Spangled Banner. Do you have anything else you want to say? No, this has been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you for taking this journey with us. Two, two, one. So we're going to sing America the Beautiful, the first and fourth verse. You probably know them all by heart. One and four. And uh, lift every voice and sing. We'll do the first and second or first and third? First and third. First and third. Good. Well, you ha do you have it all? One. Would you like to stand? We'll sing better.
this long afternoon, which you've been so patient for, culminates in what we all know in its tempo and grace as the Star Spangled Banner. I'm glad you're all standing, and as appropriate, let us touch our hearts. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.